So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, this is my first time ever to Israel. And so... <laughs> um, but it's opened up the floodgates. I have an another trip planned for January, another trip planned for next October. Anyway, um, so thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, Freddie asked me to say a little bit about my background. I guess it's uh, given the, the context of the interaction between industry and academia, that's a good thing for me to describe. I've spent exactly half my career in industry and exactly half of it in academia at this moment. So when I graduated, uh, I studied physics and, and uh, electrical engineering, and then I worked at this now bankrupt company called Polaroid. Uh, how, many of you have you heard, how many of you have heard of Polaroid? Okay, all right, all right. So it used to be just the high-tech, you know, whiz company, um, uh, but it kind of bet on the wrong technology, ultimately, for imaging. And I worked there six years, then my wife and I wanted to live in a foreign country for a year before we started having kids, so we lived in China for a year. And then I went back to school, got a doctorate, and then I worked at Mitsubishi Electric Research Labs for nine years. Uh, sort of a very long postdoc in some sense, but it wasn't the postdoc, it was like a research scientist. And I was very lucky that in that industrial research position I could keep on publishing and maintain strong ties with academia, and then in a very sort of uh, upstream move, it's not that common, and I don't really recommend it uh, as a plan, but uh, so I, I went from that industrial lab to a uh, faculty position at MIT in 2001, and I've been there ever since. And then now, fitting with this 50-50 thing, I'm on a two-year leave where I'm working at Google 80% uh, of the time, and I have a, uh, a team doing computer vision research at Cambridge, Massachusetts, and, uh, and then 20% uh, of the time I work at MIT still keeping my group going there. Um, so, let's see. Here's MIT. Here's the Stata Center where my office is at MIT. And here's the Google offices in Cambridge, and they're three minutes apart. And here's the team in, at Google. They're a great team. Guess how many Israelis are on my team? <laughs> there are three. Uh, so, Mickey Rubenstein, uh, Inbar Mosseri, and Tali Dekel all work uh, uh, in the group at Google in, uh, in Cambridge or in the Tel Aviv office. And we, so here's the, the blatant plug. Uh, we love interns. We love great graduates. Uh, we have um, uh, this crop of interns here. And, um, you know, let us know if you're interested in joining us or any of the Google offices worldwide. <laughs> okay, so that's that. Now I have to tell you how my talk fits in with the 3D theme of the conference. So, uh, as was mentioned, you want to kind of go seamlessly from the real world to the virtual world and back out to the real world. And so I'm addressing just one small slice of that whole chain. We'd like to make a camera that would look at the real world and tell you what the shape of everything is, what the material of everything is, so that you could build your virtual model and it would act just like the real world in your virtual space. So I'm going to address one little piece of that, which is how do you look at something and tell what its material is? You know, is it made out of wood? Is it made out of rubber? Uh, that's, the, that's what this addresses. And I have to warn you, it addresses it in a sort of non-conventional way. So it's not like everyone does it this way yet, or ever. <laughs> um, OK, so the, the, the title of this talk could be, What Can We Learn From Hitting Everything We See With a Drumstick? OK, here's a drumstick. And, um, all right, so the computer vision is now a data-driven science. And the way to get all our, you know, our recent amazing advances in computer vision have come from large labeled data sets. You have millions of images with the identity of every face all indicated, or you have uh, thousands and thousands of images with each object labeled by someone painstakingly in the, in the photograph. And then we can go and train machine learning methods on this labeled data and build wonderful classifiers, recognizers with our computer vision systems. We want to do the same with material, but we want to do it sort of in place. We want to know that that stuff is wood, but it's, our feeling was it's going to be very tedious to go and get a very large labeled data set of material properties everywhere. What's an alternative way that we can understand what the materials are without having someone to label for us to write down what everything is. Well, one way is you can go hit everything with a stick. Uh, let's see. 
So a lot of different sounds, and the sound tells us something about the material. So that's the plan. Instead of asking people to label everything, we're going to go hit everything we can with a drumstick, watch it at the same time with a video camera, and see if we can learn those two, use those two things together to learn about the material properties uh, just from looking at something, because we have this large data set where we both looked and uh, found out what the sound was when we hit it, and then we can use that to help train our vision system to understand what the material, you know, what it would sound like if you were to hit it. Okay, so that's the that's the plan. Um, all right, these sort of back that up. We want to know what's smooth, what's rough, what's hard, what's soft, scatters, doesn't, and then here's our program. How we're going to do it. Okay. Now, I should say, it's not just us who has this research program. Uh. So little kids learn about the world in that uh. same way. And okay, this video is kind of uncomfortable to watch for me because you know, you're not uh. supposed to give plastic to kids and let them play. <laughs> so, but, but rest assured, this child, uh, one of the... The children of one of the authors has now grown up to be four or five years old. She's past this stage. She's okay. <laughs> uh, she had a, a, a father who videoed her rather than taking it away from her. <laughs> um, okay, so in other words, kids explore the world in the same way, and they don't have a large labeled data set to, you to work with. They, they explore the world interactively, and they learn about it. And so, so this, this work here really has a kind of a science piece and an engineering piece. The engineering piece is we really want to do... We really do want to learn what the materials are. We're going to hit it with the drumstick to find out. Um, but also the science part is this is one little tiny piece of the same research program that the children have. And we want to explore uh, what can you learn from just moving around the world, listening to sounds, looking at things at the same time. What can you learn about uh, the material properties of what we're looking at? OK, so we have to instantiate this somehow. We have to convert it into a. Uh, you know, we're going to gather all this data, hitting things, looking at the video. Then we have to make it into an algorithm that will uh, train something to do. So here's the task. We're going to look at all the training data and then try to train an algorithm to have a silent view of the video and predict what the sound would be. The idea is if we can predict what the sound would be if you were to hit that thing with a drumstick, then the algorithm has to implicitly know what the materials are that you're looking at. So that's how we'll train it to know what the materials are and how we'll test whether it does. OK, so there's the goal. We're going to look at a silent version of this video and predict the audio track that would have been associated with it. And to do that, we have to understand materials. And so we hope to then train the thing to understand materials by that requirement. Um, OK, now here's. Um, there's a small chance that you might have heard of this other research that we did uh, at MIT, uh, collaborating with Fredo Durand and others, where we uh, looked at a potato chip bag with a high-speed camera and watched it vibrate when sounds impinged on it. And uh, I just want to make clear this is not the same thing. Uh, in this work, we're, we're, we're using an ordinary frame rate camera. We're not actually watching the vibrations, but that previous work was really actually measuring sound by watching it. So this is the previous work. This is a, sorry, I just had to have this in here. Uh, we played this tune as potato chips, and then you can watch it vibrate with a motion magnified version of the high-speed video. But sorry to confuse you, that's not what this is about. Here's what this is about. We're going to hit things with a drumstick, look at it with an ordinary camera, record the audio at the same time. So this is the thesis work of Andrew Owens, and he, he spent you know, a significant portion of his PhD time, going around and hitting the world with a drumstick and recording audio and video at the same time. So he would hit something, record the audio, he would go to people's offices, can I come in and hit everything with a drumstick? And, uh, and this was joint with, uh, also Philip Pizzola also took part in this, and they came up with a database of 46,000 hits, uh, drumstick hits, and um, for the algorithm we don't provide these labels, but to analyze how well we can predict material properties. We did gather labels 
of what materials were hit. So this is a histogram, uh, mostly wood, metal, dirt, then uh, leaves, plastic, cushions, concrete, rock, etc. And so um, we came up what we thought, what, with what we thought was a clever name for the data set. But I'm open to other clever names. What would you name this data set? Sorry? Oh, okay. Anyway, we called it the greatest hits. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, so, so that's the database. Um, and let me show you an example of the data, uh, or several examples, many examples of the greatest hits data set. Okay, and et cetera for 46,000 times. <laughs> so this came from about 1,000 videos, and we labeled the materials, and, act and the also the whether it was a scrape or a hit for all those 46,000 times. Sure, uh, there's, there's an artistic aspect to this too, yes. Okay, so step one, we got the data set. Now here are the following steps. We want to find a good representation for sound, a good representation for images, and then we'll do machine learning regression to go from our image representation to our sound representation to do that prediction, and then we'll evaluate how well we do. Now, why do we need a good representation for sound and images? Because we want to be able to manipulate these things as vectors, and we want to be able to mathematically ask, is this vector similar to that one, and, and have a similar vector similar representation of the sound correspond to two sounds which were perceptually similar to people. And, and, and analogously, when we, when we look for the good image representation, that means we want a vector that describes the image where two image vectors that are close to each other correspond to two images that a person would say, yeah, those are pretty similar to each other, or yeah, that's similar stuff that we're looking at. And um, so many of you are, are electrical engineers, I understand. How many of you are, are electrical engineers, please? Okay, great. Um, so you can imagine, I, we felt that it was not going to be a good representation to just look at the audio waveform and try to use that as our sound representation. Because if you, so the sound, you know, it's going at like 500 hertz, and it wiggles back and forth. And if you take two vectors of even the exact same sound and you shift them by, by a millisecond, you might have the peak of one be in the trough of the other, and they'll have a zero distance between them. Or, no, very, sorry, a very large distance between them. And so the, the, the distances of just the audio waveform aren't going to correspond to perceptual distances of how similar we think those two sounds are. So I went, uh, I gave this talk at uh, Google DeepMind, their, you know, advanced AI research lab, and I asked them, they're so full of bravado, you know, I asked them, could you take this audio waveform and just stick it in a neural network and have it work? They said, yes, of course you can. And so maybe you can, but we didn't think so. And so we uh, instead used our own sort of... Uh, hand-tuned representation for audio. And this is, very sim this is pretty standard in the audio community. This um, is kind of shown to correspond well where similar sounds perceptually correspond to similar vectors at the end. So this is uh, called a cochlear representation. It's very similar to a spectrogram representation. And here's the processing we do to get it. So you take the raw audio waveform, and then you pass it through a set of 40 different narrowband audio filters, and this is similar to what happens in our ear, I, I am to understand. And then we assert, for, this, for the purposes of this work, we feel that phase isn't important, the exact phase of the waveform. So instead of worrying about the individual ripples, we just look at the envelope of each of these passband outputs and um, measure that envelope. And then to account for large dynamic range issues, we push that through a compressive nonlinearity and get uh, a waveform like that for each subband. And then we stack them all together. So the low frequencies would go here, and the high frequencies would go up there. And this is uh, color-coded for intensity, but this is uh, large values, small values. And that's our representation for sound. And it has this wonderful property 
that if you hit different things with the drumstick and record the spectrograms, the cochleograms, um, you get this uh, a form that's characteristic to that material. So here's concrete, and it's got this very a uh, lot of high frequencies, not too many low frequencies. It's a real uh, ping. And grass has more broadband. Uh, a cushion is like a thud, so it's got a lot of low frequencies, not many high frequencies. Okay, are we clear on the representation? Okay. So, now before we get going with the video, let's just do a, a sanity check. You know, we, it's really well known or widely accepted that sound does relate to material properties. Let's just check with our sound representation and our sound database, can we predict materials from the sound? So, uh, so we take our video with the audio and we just forget about the video and we look at the spectrogram, the, sorry, I'm gonna call it cochleogram, the cochleogram for each one. And this is the same thing as what I showed you in Pseudocolor before, but it's just in black and white. I hope that's not a confusing. And we're gonna train a support vector machine, which is a standard, very powerful uh, machine learning regression technique to predict, or classification technique, to predict the category of the material from a held out training set that corresponds to any given cochleogram. And here is the resulting confusion matrix. Let me show it to you at a larger size. So here are the, the 21 categories, um, as they really were and then as they were predicted to be. And so the perfect performance would be uh, bright red along the diagonal, zero everywhere else. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. We had 40% uh, class averaged accuracy, whereas chance for the 21 category choice is 5%. Uh, and then just also as a sanity check, we did the converse. We took our image and put it into the representation that I'll tell you about shortly and tested to see how well the image alone could predict materials. And that was a little bit worse. It was 30% performance. Okay, so, um, so we've got our database, we've got our sound representation, and we've shown the sound does predict materials. Good. Now let's go on to the images. Ah, sorry. And then there's certain sort of uh, metameric categories. There are sounds that confuse uh, materials that have the same sound, and, and these come out in the, in the confusion matrix. You have the sort of the clink category and the thud category, and sometimes those are confused between each other. Okay, so... The, the whole path we want to take is we want to go from a video, predict the uh, cochleogram, and then there's a final step I'll just tell you about in a little bit where we have to go from the sound representation back out to actually make audio so we can listen to it. And I'll tell you how we do that in a little bit. Uh, first, let's talk about the regression part. Um, all right, so we're going to use a neural network for this and we're gonna use two of them stacked up. So this first one is a convolutional neural network, and that's what we do to transform to, from the video representation to this, again, a, a nice vector representation for images that are gonna have this property where similar vectors correspond to pictures that people would say are similar. And then the very last step is a recurrent neural network, uh, LSTM, for those of you who are familiar with the terminology where we go from this sequence of image representations to the sequence of sound representations, and we'll do the regression from one to the other. So to talk about the image representation, let me first tell you about the most disruptive thing that has ever happened in my research career. And, uh, sorry, and this, uh, I have to motivate it first. Um, so uh, well before I was doing research, uh, Hubel and Weasel discovered these wonderful cells in the, mem in the primate visual or mammalian visual cortex. Um, if you put electrodes into brains as they're looking, people are looking at things, as animals are looking at things, uh, you'll find selective responses, and I apologize if the people in the back can't see these things, but they're little oriented bars. These are uh, drawings of the, the, the filters, the two-dimensional filters that convolve the image in the early stages of, of our visual systems. And uh, that type of processing inspired mathematical models of them, among them so-called convolutional neural networks that, that take in an image and do a sequence of steps of convolution with a number of filters, pooling those together, running them through a nonlinearity, and then doing the same thing in repeated layers, uh, inspired by what happened, what we believe happens 
in the mammalian visual system. So here's the big disruptive thing. Um, right, so for many years, there were kind of different streams of computer vision, everyone pursuing their own approach. And there were the neural network people, and we kind of dismissed them. You know, we said, ah, oh, yeah, they do their stuff. And no one really paid that much attention to them for years, enough to get them really bitter about it. <laughs> and then they came along and just creamed everyone. They just leapfrogged the field with suddenly new, wonderful performance. Um, uh, Jeff Hinton and his two students, uh, Alex Krzyzewski and Ilya Sitzkiver, uh, developed, just worked really, really hard at it in some sense. It's hard to point to the single thing which made it work, but uh, GPUs and large training sets suddenly made this approach, which had been around for years, they got wonderful performance at it. And so it was NIPS 2012, the big machine learning conference uh, three and a half years ago, where they revealed their results, where they just totally leapfrogged the field in terms of performance and object recognition. And suddenly, and now in the three and a half years since, my research life has been turned upside down because these things are so much better than anything else anyone uses to represent images or to analyze images. So um, uh, here's a figure from that paper. And let me just show you, uh, to kind of motivate what a wonderful representation these are for images, uh, show you a visualization of what these different layers are, are processing when they analyze an image. So these slides are from Rob Fergus at NYU. Uh, so here's the first layer of filters. And if you, if you could have seen the tiny filters that I showed you before from the cat, they're actually quite similar to that. So you've got these, um, so black means multiply by a negative number, white means by a positive number. And you've got these uh, different orientation selectivity, uh, some texture selectivity. You've got luminance cells and you've got color sensitive cells or filters. So that's layer one. And then you can also make a little map of what image features uh, make those cells light up the most. So these are little patches from an image. And in this three by three square, um, the same neuron, if you will, the same computational element in the convolutional neural network favors all the things in this three by three block. So you've got this layer of processing looks for edges at different orientations, looks for little textures. So let's see what some of the other layers look at. Uh, this is layer two. And I hope you can resolve these from where you're sitting, but it's a really wonderful progression. You get more and more complicated visual structures as you go deeper and deeper in the layers of these networks. So here's a kind of leopard skin network uh, cell. Um, subtle shading, uh, th there's texture that starts to be selected for here in layer two. And then when you go finally up to layer five, you get wonderful semantic selectivity by each of these little, uh, little computational elements. So here's a face of tiny dog selective cell. And here's a uh, you know, monkey face selective cell. And um, these are just powerful, wonderful, rich image representations. And they've, as I said, completely taken over vision. And so now it's a really wonderful story uh, in terms of if you were an academic trying to design your academic fantasy of what you would like to have most happen in your career, you would probably make that storyline. I worked on something for 10, 20 years. No one paid attention. Suddenly, you're king. Everyone loves you. You're a rock star. And that's what's happened to um, Jeff Hinton and Jan LeCun. They've, they've experienced that, that academic fantasy. And, and indeed, they've contributed a lot to wonderful things to the field. OK, so that's what we use for our image representation. Uh, here's another detail. So uh, there's time that we have to worry about. And we're going to handle time in two different ways. One, we're going to put it directly into our image representation. So uh, at each moment, we're going to have stack up two different image representations into a uh, a super vector. One is the, the a single frame will put the, the convolutional neural network output as our vector for representing that frame. In addition, we're going to stack together in the red, green, and blue channels of an image. It's kind of a strange way of using them. Uh, time one, time uh, zero, and time minus one all together, the luminance components in the red, green, blue channels of, of this image and run that through the network and you get a, another vector of image representation out and we'll stack those two together and say that's how we're going to represent 
the action at, a, at any given moment. So, so it has a little record of what happened in the past two frames. And so at every moment, we put that into this, this LSTM, this regression network that we're going to talk about. And then we want to predict the cochleogram at that moment as an output. How much time do I have left, by the way? No, really? <laughs> I've been going way too slowly. OK. Uh, there's, a, again, an, an advance from years ago, but it's become popular again. Uh, there's LSTM is, is a way to do this recursive regression. And uh, so you take your representation that I just described at time t, and then there's a hidden state vector that uh, has like 40 dimensions, and there's a nonlinearity where you take the input at time t, the hidden vector at time t minus 1, and you run it through a nonlinearity that you learn by this back propagation training to get the hidden vector at the next time frame, and you pass it up to the next time frame, and then you read out from this hidden vector what the cochleogram at this time instant is by a, a linear matrix multiplication, again, where you learn all the coefficients. <sighs> OK. Now, there's that last step that I still owe you. So we've done the representations, we've done the regression, then there's one last step. How do we read out the spectrogram to make an audio that we can actually play? And uh, we did it in two different ways. The way that you would think to do it if you're an electrical engineer was one of them. You take random noise and you keep on filtering it with modified filters until you end up with this, the same cochleogram that you want to have the output of, and then you play that signal. Turns out it doesn't work that well. And in the interest of time, I'll skip those slides telling you that. Uh, but we went to a different approach, which was we used uh, example-based audio synthesis. So we took our cochleogram, and we went to our database of every sound we played and, and looked for one that had the same cochleogram. And we just grabbed the audio from that and played that instead. And it's kind of like when you wanted to synthesize a horse galloping, you take your coconuts and play them, because uh, you know it has the same sound, even though it might not be the same thing. So that's what we're going to use instead. Uh, so we um, take the, spec the, the cochleogram, look for when there's an impact by high intensities, go take this, look at the database, grab the audio corresponding to it, and play that audio. So that's the whole system. Let's see how it works. The sound I'm going to play is always the predicted sound. Here it's going to be scrolling the predicted cochleogram. And then in a second, I'll show you what the scenes were that we actually grabbed the audio from to create that. And again, the story is that our little system has learned that that rock is a hard thing so that when we create the sound that corresponds to it, it should be a nice clinky rock sound. And, the, and it also has learned that when we move the drumstick like this, that it's going to be a scraping sound that we should play. So it's learned all those things implicitly. And then here are the, uh, the, the clips we actually use to generate the audio. So those clips all have very similar cochleograms to what the network thinks is the cochleogram that should correspond to what it was looking at. Got it? Uh, let me show you some more examples. We killed a lot of plants, I'm sorry to say. See, sometimes it misses hits. Looking at it.
here's some mistakes. So it thinks that when the thing goes up like that and stops suddenly, that there's a sound that should happen. OK, I'm going to skip the part about the parametric synthesis. Um, all right, now we go to the part where you get to perform. I, I still want a little bit more of time, if that's OK. Uh, OK, two things I want left to tell you. I want to talk you, tell you how we evaluated performance, and then I want to tell you how we actually can recognize materials from this crazy scheme of banging things with the drum and recording video at the same time. So first was the evaluation, and if you permit me, I want you to play along with this. Uh, there's going to be two things played, the same video, two different audios. One of them is real, one of them we made up. Raise the hand corresponding to the side that was the real one, okay? So here we go. All right, please. Okay, now it's a mix, this is good. Uh, some right hands, some left hands, and the answer in this case was the right hand. Um, I, I actually, usually when I give this talk, I have about five minutes of doing this, but I'll spare you that and um, uh, go straight, straight to the performance of how everyone on Amazon Mechanical Turk did. So, 40% of the time, they picked our synthesized sound over the true sound as being the true sound. So that's not bad, you know? Perfect, perfection, you could argue, would be 50% of the time that you just couldn't distinguish between the two. Um, and then just for comparison, if we grab a random sound from our database and play that instead, how well did that do? Well, that, that fooled them 20% of the time. And then if we, uh, just based on the image alone, without the dynamics, without the other audio training, and looked for the, played the audio corresponding to the most similar image to what we were looking at, that gave a 33% correct response, 33% fooling rate. Okay, and then finally, he's about to kill, are you, can I have a few more? Brian, I want to tell you how we did at this task. You know, so finally, after going banging things 46,000 times, recording audio and video at the same time, do we learn something about the world? So how are we going to find that out? Let's take our little machine that we've built, which takes silent video and synthesizes what the sound would be if you hit it with a drumstick. Let's take that video, take the audio that comes out of it, and put it into this support vector machine that we concocted earlier in the talk that goes from sound to the material. And if we can correctly identify the material that way, then, then our system has implicitly learned what the materials are just from watching you hit it with a drumstick. And uh, how well does it do with that? It does pretty well. It does not, not as well as the perfect audio, because we're making up the audio. But it, it gets 23% um, class average accuracy, where again, chance is 1 over 21, which is about 5%. There's a little detail. We can take our sound image representation and pre-train it with some labeled image data for object recognition. If we do that, we get 23%. If we don't do that pre-training, we get 18%. So uh, either one is the ballpark of 20% correct. And again, just to put these numbers in perspective, using the true sounds, we got 40% correct classification, and using the image by itself, we got 30% correct. So you can indeed learn a lot about the world by hitting everything with the drumstick. And um, so a number of contributions. We have this database, which you're all welcome to use now. Um, we verified that the sounds predict materials for it, and we've used biologically inspired representations for both image and audio to develop a regression to go from the video to what the sound would be if you were to actually hit something. And we can often fool humans. And uh, thank you for your attention.